What's happening, everyone? In this video, we'll take another look at the quicksort algorithm. Specifically, we'll re-implement it to work in place, meaning we'll be performing all swaps in the original input array. In the beginning of this video, we'll briefly cover our earlier quicksort approach, then introduce the basic partitioning scheme we'll be harnessing to build our in-place version. After we've covered the theory, we'll switch over to our coding editor and actually implement the algorithm in Python. And at the end of the lesson, we'll run some benchmarks to compare the runtime performance of our new approach against the quicksort approach we coded up in the prior video. If you don't already have a firm grasp on the methodology behind the quicksort algorithm, I'd highly recommend watching the prior video, the link to which will be in the description. In our prior video, we implemented the partition operation using separate smaller than, equal to, and larger than arrays. So in essence, after randomly selecting the pivot point, we would push all values in the array smaller than the pivot into the smaller than array, all values equal to the pivot into the equal to array, and finally all values larger than the pivot into the larger than array. After recursively calling the quicksort algorithm on the smaller than and larger than arrays, we would stitch all three partitions back together and return the full array, which would then be in fully sorted order. Being that we're writing the algorithm in Python, this approach seems natural and is certainly easy to understand when looking through the code. The downside to this implementation is that on each call of the quicksort algorithm, we increase our memory footprint because we create three new arrays and subsequently fill them with copies of the values in the input array. So in this video, our goal will be to re-implement the quicksort algorithm without having to create new duplicate arrays on each function call. And to achieve this, we'll be taking influence from the popular Lumudo partition scheme. With the Lumudo partition scheme, we'll be iterating over our input array and essentially preparing it such that all values at indices below a certain index, we'll call i, are less than our pivot value, and all values at indices above i, or from i plus 1 on, are greater than the pivot. This will allow us to, at the end of the partition, swap in our pivot value into the spot we've created between the two sets of integers and successfully partition the input array around the pivot value. One downside to the Lumudo scheme is that it statically uses the last value in the array as the pivot on each partition call, whereas, recall in our prior video, we made use of the randin function to randomly select our pivot. This could easily be implemented on top of the Lumudo scheme by simply finding a random pivot using our prior method, and then swapping that out with the last item in the array, and then continuing on normally with the Lumudo scheme. You could, of course, add this into your own code, but we'll be sticking to the traditional Lumudo scheme for simplicity. Now that we've covered a rough overview of the new approach, we'll switch over to our coding editor and actually implement it in Python. So now that we have our coding editor open, some of the rest of our sorting videos will begin by carrying over our create array function. Past two integer parameters, create array will return a new array of length equal to the first parameter, where each integer element is randomly selected from zero up to the second parameter. Using default values of 10 and 50 for size and max respectively, we'll be returned arrays of length 10, where each element is randomly chosen between zero and 50. We'll be using this function both for testing, as well as in our benchmark. The next function we'll be implementing will be a helper function for the quicksort algorithm named partition. Partition will be passed three parameters. The first is the array we wish to partition, and the second and third, low and high, are integer indices into the array specifying the range we're currently partitioning. Recall that since we're developing an in-place version of quicksort, we'll always be working with the same single array, so if we wish to narrow our focus onto a single section of that array, we need two integers to specify the starting and ending indices we're currently looking at. In the picture on the screen, you can see an example of a possible call to the partition function. In this scenario, and in all calls to the partition function, we only alter values between the low and high indices and leave everything outside this range alone. The logic inside the partition function will be a direct Python analog of the Lamudo partition scheme we briefly discussed earlier. We'll begin by setting our final pivot location index i to low minus 1, so directly to the left of our specified low high range. As we explained, we'll then select our pivot to be the last value in the range, or the value at the index equal to our high parameter. We'll then enter into a for loop where we iterate an index variable j through all the values between low and high. On each iteration, if the value at the current index is less than or equal to the pivot, we'll increment our final pivot index i and swap the values at i and j. This will effectively grow the yellow portion, as you can see on the GIF, by a single item. At the end of the for loop, we'll have found the correct final pivot location at index i plus 1, so we'll swap it in and return its index. Returning the final pivot index will allow us to, in the actual quicksort function, properly identify the regions containing smaller and larger values. All smaller values being within the range from low up to our pivot index, and all larger values being from the pivot index up to high. Now that we have the partition function out of the way, we've actually covered the most complex portion of the code, as the actual in-place quicksort function is fairly straightforward. To allow us to differentiate between our new implementation and the quicksort approach we coded up in the prior video, We'll be naming our quicksort function quicksort underscore in place. The function will be passed the array we wish to sort, as well as low and high integer parameters. By default, low will be set to zero, and high will be set to none, 
allowing us to simply call the function passing only our array as input. Inside the function, the first thing we'll be doing is checking to see if the high value is none, in which case we'll know we're in the first call of the function and should set this value manually. Because we want to sort the entire array, we'll use the last index of the array as the new high value. Anything less than this would only result in a partially sorted array output. Next, we'll enter into our main if statement, where we check to see if the low index is less than the high. If this is untrue, we'll know we're finished sorting the array and we'll return from the function. If this is true, we'll call the partition function, passing our array and our current low and high indice values. We'll save the return value of the partition function to a variable pivot index. After partitioning, similar to our prior implementation, we'll complete the function with two separate recursive calls. The first recursive call will be sorting on the range between low and the pivot, and the second call will be sorting on the range between the pivot and high. We'll now write some code to test out a new quicksort implementation. We'll simply be creating a new array using our create array function, then printing that to terminal. Then calling the quicksort in place function, passing a as the only parameter, and again printing out a, this time hopefully in sorted order. Running the script in terminal, we can see we have successfully sorted our randomized array, meaning our function is working great. We'll now write our code to benchmark our new approach against the quicksort we coded up in the prior video. We'll just be pasting in the code from that lesson directly. For the benchmark, we'll be testing on randomized arrays of length 10 up to 1 million in multiples of 10. For each length, we'll sort three randomized arrays and take the average time for both our in-place as well as our prior quicksort approach. At the end, we'll print out the results in a table format. As we can see, our new in-place approach is actually faster for smaller input array sizes up to between 10 and 100,000. For larger sizes, the two times are still fairly close, but the prior implementation takes the win for speed. This logically makes sense if we're optimizing our code to run in a smaller memory footprint. It's intuitive that we may lose efficiency in other areas, namely in this case we suffer from greater time complexity. That takes us to the end of this video, everyone. I hope you enjoyed it and have a better perspective on not only quicksort, but on re-implementing algorithms to run in place. If you did find this lesson helpful, consider liking the video, dropping a comment, or subscribing to my channel. In the future, I'll be continuing mainly with algorithms and data structures, but look out for fun and interesting coding projects, probably covering machine learning topics or something similar. And I'll see you guys next time.